MedCram. Welcome to another MedCram video. Today we're going to talk about H5N1 Influenza A or bird flu. Exactly what it is that's going on and why this matters. It's a virus. It's these brown little circles here being cultured in this green cells that you can see here. So why are people getting excited about this? Let's step back a little bit and talk about some of the pandemics that we've had in the past. So in 1918, Spanish flu was avian in origin, and about 50 to 100 million people died worldwide. In 1957, the Asian flu, which was also avian in origin. The term avian, we mean that it was a virus that was particularly seen in birds, and that killed about a million people worldwide. Again, in 1968, same sort of situation. In 1996, we first detected the H5N1 type influenza. And since about 2003, we've seen multiple outbreaks worldwide. Let's talk about exactly what we mean by all of these expressions, H5N1, multiple outbreaks, etc. Specifically, what is it now that's causing people to be excited in a bad way? What's going on now as of April 7, 2024, as we're recording this, is that H5N1, which is a particular type of influenza virus normally seen in birds, has recently been detected for the very first time in goats and cows. And there is some evidence, although it's not confirmed yet, that there could be possible cow-to-cow -cow transmission of this virus and possible cow-to-human transmission, although we're not exactly sure at this point, but it's emerging. This is the influenza A virus. There are proteins that extend from the surface that allow it to interact with different cellular receptors. Two of those proteins are the hemagglutinin, or HA, or H, and the neuraminidase, which is NA. Depending on the types of these proteins, this will determine how it behaves. And they are classified into an H category and an N category. And that is why this particular virus is known as an H5N1, avian influenza. You can see here that there are different human seasonal influenza viruses. And typically there is an influenza A and an influenza B particularly, but there are other influenzas in terms of animals. But in terms of humans, it's A and B that typically will infect human beings. And the different subtypes like A, H1, N1, that was in the 1918 pandemic. From there, there are different subtypes which are called clades. So you have types, which is influenza A, subtypes, which is the H1N1, or in this case, the H5N1, and then clades. We'll talk a little bit about clades and then, of course, subclades. Nomenclature is the virus type, where it was isolated, the number strain, the year of isolation, and the virus subtype. What we're talking about today is H5N1. It was first found in a goose predominantly in 1996 in the Guangdong province of China. So this was first detected in around 1996 or 1997. There were poultry outbreaks of this H5N1 in China and Hong Kong with 18 associated human cases that went from the bird directly to the human. And at that point, there were six deaths out of 18, giving it about a 33% mortality. This would go on since that time and to up to now to about 888 different human infections with a greater than 50% death rate. And that's why it's known as highly pathogenic avian influenza or HPAI. If this hits your chickens, these chickens will be dead within 48 hours. That's why it's incredibly important to contain these types of outbreaks, especially for commercial industry, because it can literally wipe out your chickens overnight. Things started to really take off around 2003 with a lot more outbreaks in the Netherlands, Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, and it spread all throughout the world, including the Middle East, Europe, and Africa. In 2014 to 2016, it was detected in the United States, in wild birds, and in poultry. So these are things that we see not only in commercial birds, but also in birds that are wild and fly and migrate. At this point, there was different subtypes that emerged called H5N6 and H5N8, which went on to their own things, overshadowed the H5N1. But H5N1 continued to further evolve into this very important clade that we'll talk about called the 2.3.4.4B clade. It's this clade that we're actually seeing this activity in. 
In 2021, during the COVID pandemic, there was a new 2344B detected in North America in the wild. And since that time, there have been outbreaks not only in commercial poultry, but also in the wild and sporadic outbreaks in humans and in mammals. In fact, mammals all across the world, especially now in 2024 in April in dairy farms, which has gone to 16 different dairy farms in six different states as I speak here on April 7th. What we have not seen before is that this is now able to spread from potentially cow to cow and also cow to human. That's what we're actually confirming, but it seems as though there is information that would highly suggest that. What we definitely know at this point is that it is in cows. In Peru, highly contagious H5N1 avian flu killed thousands of pelicans and other birds and we knew at that point it had spread to sea lions because they were also seeing a number of sea lions dead in Peru, for instance, in this article. So we have known for a long time that this virus can cross over from birds into mammals. But again, what is new is that we're seeing it in goats and cows for the first time. There is possible cow-to-cow -cow transmission and possible cow-to-human transmission. We'll talk a little bit more about those. A little bit more about H5N1, the asymptomatic carriers. So these are animals which can carry the virus and not be dead within 24 hours. Things such as ducks, geese, and swans, and shorebirds such as plovers and sandpipers, which you might see running around on the beach. However, mammals that have been detected with H5N1 and have been sick in any kind of variation, some of them have died very quickly, some of them have not died. There seems to be a wider variation on that. Foxes, bears, seals, sea lions, polar bears, domestic cats, which we'll have some information about shortly. Dogs, minks, goats, and cows. And of course, these are the new things that we're now seeing. The USDA has actually put up a map on their website, and we link to it here, where you can see where different types of mammals have been found to have H5N1 influenza virus. Right now, goats last month in 2024 were found to be positive on a Minnesota farm where it is well known that ducks and chickens had already tested positive for H5N1. And about a week later, there were cows that were detected. You can see in which states these are. And I actually have a list here of the states and the dates that they were found in going from March 25 to April 4th. This is the clade 2.3.4.4b. This was first seen introduced in wild birds in 2021, and it looks as though this virus is very similar looking in these animals. In other words, there hasn't seemed to be a major mutation that has caused a jump to allow this. It just seems like it's happened. This could have actually happened a while ago, and we're now just detecting it here. We've known for some time that this type of virus can infect baby cows without much in terms of major mutation. So it doesn't seem as though there's a major mutation that has occurred that is allowing this to happen. Although when you have outbreaks, that allows for a lot more transmission and allows for a lot more mutations to occur. And there could be a mutation that allows the virus to infect a much broader host variation. The big thing here is humans. About 888 human cases of H5N1 since it was first detected back in the mid to late 90s. These usually come directly from birds, either commercial or wild. And so you'll typically see that these human cases were in very close contact. Sometimes it's difficult to determine if there is human to human contact because that is what is necessary to actually have a pandemic. So a lot of times what will happen is you'll see multiple humans in a specific area that have come down with H5N1, but you're unsure about whether or not they both came surreptitiously directly from the animal or if one went to the human and then spread to another human. The data is not looking good here in terms of survivability, 50 to 60% fatal if you do catch it. So that's why it's really important if you see dead fowl to be very careful and wear protective equipment. Usually contact with infected birds or saliva, mucus, poop without protective equipment is the risk factor. There is a very wide ranging symptoms in humans as opposed to what we see in animals where it's almost 100% fatal. In humans, it's 50 to 60% fatal, but you might see something as mild as conjunctivitis, which we're seeing currently in this one case that we have in Texas, or it could be sneezing, coughing, pneumonia, even death, as we see here 50 to 60% of the time. There's only been two cases of H5N1 in the United States. One was seen in a Colorado prisoner whose job it was to take care of these dead fowl. 
and he only developed fatigue from those symptoms. This was in 2022. In Texas here in April of 2024, someone that was confirmed infected with H5N1, and their only symptom at this point is pink eye. These cattle farms where we're seeing it, none of the cows have actually died, and the human here just pink eye. So we're more concerned about the actual ability to transmit, and one of the biggest concerns is whether or not there has been some sort of change in the genetic material that is allowing them to do this, and currently we're not seeing that what about any documentation of human-to-human -human transmission in the history of H5N1? Well, there's about eight cases that have been documented. It's unclear and we can't confirm necessarily because, again, it's difficult when you have multiple humans in the same area that come down. Did they all get it because of their job working with the birds or with contact with birds that might have been in that area? Or did it go from one and then spread from one human to another? That's what's necessary for a pandemic to occur. So if we look here at a graph about human cases, since it was first discovered in 1997, there's been quite a bit of human cases in the past, and currently where we are right here is in 2024. So not a lot of human contraction of this virus. The concern here is that there are new species now that have been able to get it. We're unsure exactly why that's the case, because we haven't seen much of a change in the genetic material. What about treatment? So all of these are currently FDA-approved treatments for influenza A, which this is a type. So these medications do have specific indications for specific age groups. You should look at the labels for that. But if someone were to come down with H5N1, these are the medications that we would be going with. The seasonal flu shot does not cover H5N1, so that's something that's important to know. If you've gotten the flu shot, there is no protection against H5N1. We've talked about some of the data, for instance, in terms of NAC and its ability to relieve symptoms if taken prophylactically at 600 milligrams twice daily during a winter season for the regular influenza type A. There's no data against H5N1, but it might be something worth considering if that's something that you have a high risk for. We've talked about hydrotherapy in terms of our knowledge of interferon. Interferon is one of the major ways that your body has of dealing with viral infections. And almost all of these viruses which are pathogenic, including COVID-19's SARS-CoV-2 and also this influenza's H5N1, they all seem to reduce the body's ability to mount a response against the virus in terms of interferon. Anything that you can do to increase interferon levels may be beneficial, although we do need to have more randomized placebo-controlled trials in terms of H5N1. We do have very good data in terms of hepatitis C and SARS-CoV-2, at least in vitro. There are vaccines that are available for H5N1. Some of them have been approved by the FDA. They have been available almost 20 years ago and are of the traditional type of vaccination. Look for that topic in future videos. Currently, in terms of precautions, obviously avoiding unprotected exposures to sick or dead animals, not just birds, as we found out, because this virus can get into mammals, as we found, but particularly birds, poultry, domesticated birds, wild or domesticated animals like cattle now, animal carcasses, raw milk, feces, poop, litter from animals with confirmed or suspected H5N1, of course. There's also specific recommendations for farmers, livestock, poultry owners. We'll put a link in the description below. In terms of exposure, the current recommendations are that they should be monitored for at least 10 days after the last exposure for symptoms, as that approximately correlates with the incubation period. We recently did a video on how to prepare for the next pandemic, and the recommendations that I would give are the same as those recommendations. If we have a pandemic where that type of mortality rate is in play, it's going to be very difficult to continue a supply chain for medication, so make sure that you are well prepared. And we go over how you can do that in this video, Disease X, How to Prepare. This is something that has happened before in this type of virus, so it's not far-fetched to believe that it could happen again. We currently have infected birds that are able to transmit it between each other, and then these are being transmitted to specific animals like cats and cattle and actually directly to humans as well. But for these things to create their own pandemic within that population, what we need to see is cow-to-cow -cow transmission, mammal-to-mammal transmission. 
The question is whether or not we're seeing that. The reason why I say that is because the H5N1 virus was first seen in the Idaho cattle ranch only after infected cows from Texas were transported to Idaho, and that needs to be confirmed as well. Currently, we've only seen one person in this outbreak in April of 2024 who's come down with confirmation of H5N1. We have not seen yet any human-to-human transmission of this virus. There are some reports that I have seen that cats on those dairy farms where the cows are have proved to be 100% susceptible to the H5N1 virus and are dead within 24 to 48 hours of getting the virus. That is a bit disturbing. Here are some press releases. They said that initial testing has not found changes to the H5N1 virus that would make it more transmissible to humans. And while cases among humans in direct contact with infected animals are possible, this indicates that the current risk to the public remains low. What about milk and beef? The question now is whether or not it is contaminated with the virus. When you pasteurize milk and deeply cook beef well, you're going to be killing the virus, and so it is of no risk in that situation. So I hope this answers a number of questions, what the situation is, what we currently know, and what we're currently working on. For more information, subscribe, turn notifications on, leave us a comment, and join us at medcram.com for more continuing medical education videos for not only healthcare providers, but also patients. Thanks for joining us.